Hello and good evening, friends. Welcome again in this episode, second episode of Quest for Freedom. On behalf of Freedom Express, I am Prashant. Uh, in the last episode, we discussed how a steam engine, which triggered the Industrial Revolution, had started making the modern world as we see today and reorganizing the map of Europe. Today, we will go to Asia. And we will see in early 19th century, the post-steam engine and post-industrial revolution, what was happening in Asia. Because much of the development, of course, was happening in, in, in Europe because of scientific development. And a certain political thought was also emerging in Europe. But something different was happening in Asia. And today, since India was in under the colonial rule, to India and China, they were the two giants in Asia. Uh, something very interesting was happening during this period in these two countries. So let me begin with the parties up. We get the parties up. Now, just you know, can you how can you connect the dots with what was happening in uh, 18th century and uh, and as we graduate to 19th century with the industrial revolution and some political thought already emerging in Europe, what was happening in this part of the world in Asia? Uh, I think uh, China has been at the forefront of cottage industry, yes. like India and China, yes. the main uh, economic powers in the world at that time. India contributed uh, more than a quarter to world GDP, uh, world trade. And similarly, China was the main contributor. Yeah. We were the two major world economies at that time. Yeah. Uh, agriculture and small scale industry had a very strong base in, uh, in China. And China also had very large resources of uh, coal and iron, which are the main constituents for industry. Because all industry requires iron is a primary need, and to run industry you require fuel. And China had huge reserves of coal, so China was really ready for that. And uh, one thing really puzzles me that these two big powers, India and China, somehow lagged in modern science, lagged behind in modern science and weaponry as well, because modern science uh, empowered the, the military West. power of, of the West, of the Europe. And uh, unfortunately, being very large population, large uh, areas, these countries like India and China, they, they suffered. China did not suffer that kind of humiliation, is like slavery of the imperial power. But uh, China was continuously uh, under threat. And uh, let me give you two, three things. I visited the Macau years ago. Okay. And I learned from there that Macau was in Vasco de Gama came to India in Portugal uh, in um, Goa and then his expedition also went to Macau which was a part of China. And uh, so it was like 500 years ago and uh, so these expeditions uh, sea power was growing and uh, sea expeditions were going all over from Europe to uh, Asia. And uh, they wanted to create markets for, uh, rather, for initially for the trade. And later on, when the steam engine uh, was invented or uh, it, it is triggered, the, you mentioned the industrial revolution, then these European powers wanted to capitalize and have markets and resources control uh, in China as well, like, just like India. But because the central authority of China was quite strong, so they could not uh, enslave China just like India. But uh, through various uh, maneuverings and war like opium war, they created markets for themselves in, those, uh, in China. And uh, one thing more I would like to mention here, that uh, currently China is emerging as a big power. And uh, it's not uh, 
for the first time in history china was a big power earlier also like 300 years ago yeah. china was a big power and uh, then there is a lot of antagonism between uh, neighbors like india and china they had a you know a stand off um, in doklam a year ago or maybe two years ago and now recently there was a problem in ladakh but i think uh, these are uh, certainly problems of concern but i think they should not overshadow the relationship between these two asian giants and i would like to mention two three things in this connection number one china uh, has been a agrarian society just like india and there has been a uh, exchange of ideas cultures between the two buddhism in india went to china and from china it went to other countries in asia and china even today buddhism is well respected recognized and quite wide spread religion in china much much wider uh, acceptance it has than it has in india so let me let me let me the party sahab like uh, to take these two very key points you mentioned uh, about china one is the buddhism and the other is the opium war let me let me bring uh, professor rizwan here he so as you mentioned professor party that uh, uh, india was already contributing in, in uh, 18th century uh, or almost one fourth of the gdp of the world and uh, and then suddenly the during the colonial rule things slipped but but in terms of china was buddhism any factor how you see the Buddha, spread of buddhism in china professor rizwan and uh, the opium war because we were we were hit by diseases and you know uh, uh, famine and all these things in 18th century as well but what was happening in china see when professor tripathi mentions uh, prevalence of buddhism yeah and uh, that being practiced as a faith and the faith also impacting you know uh, culture or cultural practices of a sizable chunk of the chinese population basically the point that he is trying to make is that how india and china enjoyed cultural proximity yeah and also enjoyed uh, theological relations as regards buddhism so we have buddhism flourishing in india and we have buddhism being picked up by large many chinese scholars in ancient times and that practice continued on only when you realize that religion travels from one place to another along with that what also travels the philosophy of life theology cultural practices in certain cases uh, Uh, we can also see linguistic interactions between uh, now in india etc etc that's number one number two if you look at mainland china and if you look at areas closer to china and then you realize they also enjoyed close proximity say for instance nalanda university uh, uh, was taken deep interest by uh, people living in tibet and tibetan buddhism tibetan buddhism drew a lot of inspiration from the kind of buddhist philosophy that was being developed in nalanda university and as a matter of fact not many scholars used to come station themselves uh, in nalanda university go back prepare treatises as a matter of fact it is the preservation of their treatises which also gives us impression about as to what what happened what happened to nalanda university so in a way the point which is being made uh, is that india and china not only been neighbors but they been neighbors with bringing about mutual influence upon each other in the realm of religion culture uh, practices values etc etc as regards 19th century opium wars other difficulties technological invasion because what happened is happening with china in the uh, middle of the 19th century is just not the cultural interact interaction between the west and china as a matter of fact it is technological invasion and we see that china been subjected to two opium wars from 18 uh, 39 40 to 42 and again in 1856 uh, to 60 when the second opium war was fought 
So we have the first opium war and the second opium war. But the question that, that arises as to why did the opium war happen in the first place? And that is where then we realize that unequal trading relationship between East India Company and China was uh, to the disadvantage of the British East India Company. Balance of trade was not in their favor as China had very little to accept from the West and it had plenty more to export in variety of ways. One of those items happened to be tea, what we call in India, chai. And uh, the, you know, agents of British East India Company imported uh, half a pound of tea in the year 1664, introduced it in China, in England, let the board of directors know that here is a drink which is used on a large scale in China. And that is where everybody tasted that cup of tea. And within 100 years, tea became the national drink of England. <laughs> so much so that the British Parliament made it incumbent on the British East India Company to ensure that at any given point of time, a stock of tea was maintained uh, up to uh, for up to one year. That means there should never be any shortage of it. If at all, if there was any shortage, it was likely to cause a kind of a crisis. It is this imbalance in trade against the British East India Company, which, you know, initiated opium trade. The British East India Company and many other, you know, other European trading companies, they started importing opium. Opium as kind of a drug. And then China slowly but steadily started becoming victim of these trading practices, drug trading practices, drug in the form of opium. And when Chinese wanted to resist, the British East India Company, many of their agents, they did not like it. And they wanted to stop China from getting any aggressive in this regard, which broke out in the first opium war. What happened as a consequence of it? will follow. And over to you, Prashant. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Professor Dilwar. When I come back to you, we will discuss, you know, the kind of political thought or political organization, political reorganization emerging in that area, post-opium war in China, and, and then the journey of China in the 19th century. Uh, Professor Dilwar, let me, let me you know, discuss with you uh, two very specific things, you know, towards the end of uh, uh, 19th century, uh, we were India was hit by pandemic and followed by famine, so, and then uh, we also know that you know rulers like Tipu Sultan, Begum Mazlat Mahal of Lucknow, they were inspired and influenced by uh, what was happening in France. Yes, yes, yes. So a kind of political thought started emerging. Uh, uh, in India, and and then there was a uh, pandemic and uh, famine. So how India, you know, cope up with that? Uh, the colonialism uh, was also there. East India East India Company got converted into the British Empire during this period. So how you see in that period the story of India? I think uh, India, I really feel very, very much worried. Uh, by the end of uh, uh, 18, uh, around 1800, uh, when Tipu Sultan was defeated, I think a uh, real curse started on India. East India Company was very brutal and gradually they started controlling different parts of the country. And I think uh, I would like to mention two things. Uh, 1857. Uh, till 1857, India was almost under British control and uh, there was a rebellion around that time. And I think uh, the opium war on China, uh, China lost that war and uh, they had to succumb to, uh, they had to accept very humiliating conditions put by the British. <coughs> and they had to open not only uh, their country for opium, but also for many things. And uh, that was... Uh, the beginning of downfall of uh, Chinese economy, Chinese society. I'm not familiar with the kind of uh, that were taking place in India around that time, but what was happening in China, 
but their economic conditions greatly deteriorated. And it was just complete dominance of Euro over Asia and African countries uh, by the end of uh, 1800 or uh, early 19, um, um, rather 1700, uh, uh, later part of 18th century and 19th century, there was really curse on Asian and African countries. Now, I want to mention uh, uh, regarding India, that when the famines were taking place in India during the British rule, the situation with the small scale industry was uh, pretty bad. The textile industry suffered uh, devastation in India. I'm not very sure what happened uh, to their textile industry in China, their silk industry in China. Um, I met some friends in uh, America, Chinese friends in America. So I'm not that much familiar with that. But one area where they were lacking was science education. Uh, you know, Britain had a long tradition of Oxford, Cambridge, and uh, other uh, universities, mm. hundred years, and uh, there was a culture. So the evolution of science doesn't take place in isolation. It is an institution. It is a It is through institutions science evolves. And obviously, um, if you have a industrial uh, authority or state power supporting if there is a linkage between education and industry, then science grows more rapidly. And this was happening in Europe, but was not happening in China or India. So the, I think the one area where they faulted was this. Another thing I want to mention, uh, because I went to Assam, and uh, I wanted to find out who are these Ahom people. Mm -hmm. I, so there is a conflict between Indian um, people who migrated to Assam from Bengal due to the collapse of textile cottage industry in Bengal. And they had to migrate to different parts of the, um, probably their neighbor was Assam. So people from working class, people from West, from Bengal migrated to Assam. And then there was some antagonism. And recently, uh, there has been much more antagonism between the uh, home people and these. So who are these home people? I discovered that in the uh, 13th century, 12th and 13th century, people from Hunan province of China migrated to India. These are the home people. So uh, it's not that uh, India and China were really isol in isolation with each other. They had only cultural exchange. They had a population migration as well. And uh, there is one more, more historical, if you really go back, to, uh, I, somebody told me. Yes. Uh, uh, Brahmaputra River, and river is not only a water flow, it has its culture, what kind of production people in that region would have. So river is a lifeline of society, aggregate in society. And that goes from China to India, it's older than the Himalayan mountain. So I think India has a very ancient relationship with China, and uh, I, I would not be. But my my question with the Professor Rizwan then that you know India and China had ancient relationship. We had civilizational relationship. Our religion religion which was born in this part of the world uh, exported to China, and from there it went to other countries. Uh, how then we missed out? You know, up to up to the uh, Galvan Galvan Valley situation. Number one. Number two. Uh, post Opium War, how China made its story? How China re-emerged? And what was happening with Japan also? Can you please elaborate? Uh, two things that I would like to say. Say, for instance. Uh, uh, Historical developments are being linked to the larger question of uh, Galwan Valley and the kind of conflict mm -hmm. situation that arose between India and China. Yeah. And uh, obviously, it generates curiosity when there have been a lot of historical opportunities of closer interaction, give and take, exchange, not only of goods, but ideas, philosophies, cultures, languages, literature, values, etc., etc. Then how is it that uh, such a thing happened? Uh, Prashanti, you would like to recall uh, there's a, the, there was a Hindi film uh, called Dr. Kotlinski Amar Kahani. Yeah, yeah. And Dr. Kotlinski is someone 
who had gone over to China in order to help Chinese revolutionary in the context of their revolutionary campaign. And here they had, he, along with his team, had camped in China in order to help them. And Chinese recognized such services rendered by Dr. Kutli. If you look at, you know, the sympathies expressed towards Chinese revolutionary from the platform of Indian National Congress, there has been no dearth of and no opportunity ever missed in expressing solidarity with China and its revolutionary campaign. But then, that is still about the revolution. Post-revolutionary revolutionary situation, then we realize that Chow and Lai, Mao Zedong, I mean, the manner in which they uh, conducted their diplomacy and international politics as regards India in the context of 1962 war between the two countries. And that is where, you know, it was out of the ordinary slogan given by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, yeah. Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. What happens? Somebody has to respect it. It cannot be unilateral. So if India says Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai, it certainly meant it. But what it was meaning to also got to be respected by the neighbor. And that is where I think never got into another trajectory of conducting its relationship with India in a manner as if uh, these two countries were more kind of a uh, rival and uh, therefore uh, China would dominate given its size of population, uh, geographical area, resources that were available to, and the kind of political system that they built. I mean, what India built post-1947 was yeah. one of the... See, the my, 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 my curiosity was, uh, Professor Rizwan, was the political system that was emerging post opium war in China and which which you know up to up to the mao setung uh, see uh, what is happening post opium war political there is no political system emerging in china as a matter of fact chinese imperial system continued to remain there till 1911 that is where you know the manchu dynasty uh, was brought to an end because in 1911 you have a republican revolution taking place and the person who comes to power is someone called Yuan Shi Kai and after Yuan Shi Kai it is the strong man of China called Chiang Kai Shek so till about 1911 Manchus continued to rule over except that in coastal areas colonies were taken in by number one England later France and later many other European countries what under a system what came to be known as the treaty port system and every big every country who could you know like muscle up to China and they said that okay <coughs> let us sign an agreement under treaty port system and a particular port would be handed over to that particular country for all kinds of activity so <coughs> overall <coughs> no no systematic uh, systemic transformation in China as a consequence of except what was mentioned earlier by Professor V.K. Tripathi that China's Chinese economy took a great hit. Unemployment arose. Uh, the value of Chinese currency uh, went for a toss. Is it still China pulled along? But then in 1911 system undergoes transformation because of the local stimulus and also because of the interaction of the Chinese people with, with external forces present on Chinese soil. So that's another uh, another area. Okay. Uh, Professor Tripathi, I'm coming back to uh, in my concluding part uh, towards India. And one thing, one factor and one important development I surely do not want to miss out uh, that was happening in early 19th, 19th century and post-1857 uh, rebellion, uh, British was systematically crushing uh, the rebellion. Then uh, they systematically devised how to create a rift between Hindus and Muslims. This is the period when first census was also happened uh, in 1882 uh, perhaps. The first census report came. That was all India census. That was undivided India. Today's Bangladesh and Pakistan included. And after that first census, 
the real hindu muslim divide started happening and british was using all kinds of tactics tactics and this is the period when you know the first litigation of babri masjid also started in ayodhya though in a very local and a small level but it was started on papers well uh, india during uh, after 1857 rebellion uh, i think uh, is one of the darkest phases in indian history yes essentially the phase it was the built up of divide and rule policy and that eventually led to the partition of the country many countries have in the world have, part, have partition have been uh, wherever there was imperial or colonial rule they essentially thrive on divide and rule policy and that was the beginning uh, after 1857 in india and i consider this to be uh, terrible on two counts number one culturally india has been a you know culture uh, you know pluralistic society yes there has never been religious conflicts though i can consider one religious conflict has been area that a very large chunk of indian population denied to practice religion they were not be allowed to enter the temple though they were the real people who built the temples but they were not allowed to practice there so in that sense uh, there was a complete rejection or complete repression of people that you cannot so they were outcast by religion that was there but as far as the religions across the world when they were evolving india was open to them it christianity came just after the crucifixion of jesus here islam came during the lifetime of prophet muhammad here yes so, so indian society caste wise very repressive but religious religion wise quite open quite open yes quite open and after 57 this was the religion that was made a major factor for dividing people islam in india had evolved a culture overlapping culture and it was such a great you know can you imagine that a weaver muslim weaver and a hindu peasant they are living side by side and supplementing each other their cultures were really had a lot of overlap yeah professor rizwan uh, professor rizwan correct me if i am wrong that there is no history of communal violence before 1857 and the first census the way it was conducted the the seeds of party partition was sown there it was the first very you know articulate social engineering between hindus and muslim devised and engineered by british professor the party mai ni rizwan se puchna hai rizwan sir please i think i would entirely agree with this i would entirely agree with this uh, understanding that communal rights have been in a way a contribution of the british in order to you know project and portray two uh, major communities in india that is hindus and muslims as being perpetually in conflict as a matter of fact you know in small pockets on some occasion at another point of time in history there may have been an occasion of conflict but it was never a kind of a mass consciousness among indians i give you one example professor tripathi has been talking about the rebellion process in 1857 57 yes <clears throat> that is the time a lot of ulama gave a call for jihad yes the british yes and the british put up a poster on the steps of jama masjid saying how can you declare jihad against us the british christians and they use the term ahle kitab that is you as muslims are ahle kitab because you follow quran and we as christians are ahle kitab because we follow injil and that is what islam has said mm. and you know in reply to that ulama put up another poster on the steps of jama masjid and what they said is interesting and important for all of us to take note of ulama said hindus are our brothers you are our enemy okay and in our jihad against you we are one hindus and muslims are one against you and we don't accept you as one of us 
you know, so in a way, not only that, in the context of Rai Bareli, when you have Khan Bahadur Khan, who had established a rebel regime, yes. the British had set aside 50,000 rupees to create communal trouble. That is, nothing much happened is another issue. But they were spending money, they were spending administrative resources, political resources, in order to create trouble between Hindus and Muslims. But then that's not been the historical experience of the two major communities in India. So that way the British will have to really own up uh, uh, quite a bit of responsibility towards creating this kind of consciousness, resulting in conflict and resulting in all kinds of difficulties in the realm of society culture. Thank you, Professor Rizwan. Thank you, Vikit Tipati Sahib. And uh, today we discuss, you know, much part of the 19th century. Uh, when we when we move forward in next episodes, we will see what was happening in India. Our freedom struggle was in prime, and then there was uh, diseases and famine also with together. We we travel to 20th century with uh, seeds of partition with us. And, and, and Europe entered into 20th century with scientific power. And then what happened in the 20th, early 20th century, we will discuss in coming episodes. Stay with us. Keep subscribing Freedom Express. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.